to do tonight. Well, let's take our Bibles, if you would, and go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians, chapter number 2. And we're going to look tonight at the first five verses of this second chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And, of course, we are in a series in this book. And, uh, and so uh, we're going to, uh, again, continue in this series. If you, if you found your place and you're able to stand, I'd invite you to stand as we read the uh, first five verses of 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. We will pray, and then uh, we'll allow you to be seated as we begin the message tonight. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, in verse number 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. With God's help to you tonight, I'd like to preach a message I've entitled A Template for Ministry. A Template for Ministry. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you tonight, and uh, Lord, our hearts have been so um, lifted up as we have uh, been in this service tonight through the beautiful music, the reflection on the love of God. Uh, Lord, as we enter into this week in which we consider the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection, we're reminded that, Lord, that was an act of love. Lord, as we heard the song just a moment ago, the day that you wore our crown. Well, that should have been us. We deserved what you suffered, and yet you willingly took our place. We do thank you for what's happened in our state in this past week, and it's certainly something that as Bible-believing Christians we can celebrate and we can rejoice in. Lord, the battle is still, is still raging, and certainly because there's maybe been a, a small victory uh, does not mean at all that we can rest, and we thank you for these that have been an example to us all in fighting this good fight. Lord, as we conclude this service tonight with preaching from the Word of God, I pray that you'd help me, that you'd fill me, that you'd use me as I attempt to share this, this template, this pattern that the Apostle Paul gives us as he worked in the church at Corinth and established that church through the power of Christ. Now bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we're certainly understanding that the church at Corinth had a lot of problems, and that precipitates the title of this series, which is Walk Away. And we have presented this thought or this idea that in most cases, most of us probably would have examined the church at Corinth. We would have seen the problems that existed there, the issues that were present there, and we would have said, you know, it's really not worth any effort. I don't think that a, that a simple letter that I would write, I don't even think if I went there and spent some time there, I don't think that I would really make much of an impact. Perhaps that church is too far gone, and, 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 and we, we, we would have said, you know, I'm just going to walk away from it. We would not have been surprised if that was the Apostle Paul's attitude. And I suppose we maybe would not have been surprised if the, if the Lord himself looked down from heaven and said, you know, I, I, I know what's going on. I, I know the secret sins of this church, and I know the sins that are, uh, that are, that are welcome and, and, and that are out in the open that everyone knows about. And, and so we're going to remove the candlestick, as he, as he threatened to do in Revelation chapter number 2 and chapter number 3 in the letters to the seven churches. But that's not what happens. The Apostle Paul does not walk away. And more importantly, the Holy Spirit of God does not walk away from this church. There's something redeemable that is here. And, uh, and so Paul takes pen in hand and he begins to write this letter to the church at Corinth. Unless we think, well, the letter was all for naught, we get a second book of Corinthians in which it seems as though much has been improved, much has been corrected, and there's a completely different tone in the second book or in the second letter that leads us to believe that the first letter was heeded, uh, that the wisdom that Paul gives from the Holy Spirit of God uh, was taken, it was received, and, and God did a, a reviving work in the church at Corinth. And I ask the question, what does a messed up church need? What does a church that's got problems need? Do they need a better preacher? Does a messed up church need a nicer facility or better property in a better part of town? Does a carnal church, which is certainly the church at Corinth, does it need better staff members? Does it need more money in the offering plate? I'm here to tell you that I believe a church could reverse its course without any of the things that have been mentioned. None of, none of the things that we have just mentioned are necessary for a church to turn around and go the right way. 
God, God, has, God has used men who perhaps couldn't preach all that well, but they loved people and they loved the Lord and God filled them and God used them. God has used churches that didn't have a whole lot of resources and didn't have a whole lot of money, but they had a love for God, they had a heart for God, and God used them. God, listen, God, God, God is using in this day and age, listen, you go to some, chi- uh, some, some communist countries and, or communist uh, city, uh, cultures, China, some of these places, and you'll, you'll find they don't have church buildings. They don't have beautiful properties. They don't have padded pews and, and uh, 501c3s. They don't have these types of things that sometimes we think are necessary for a church to function. Yet God is using them to do a great work. I'm here to tell you that a church can reverse course without the things that have been said. That a, that a church that is carnal and divided, it needs one thing, and it's not a better preacher. And it's not a bigger offering. And it's not a nicer property. And it's not a a new influx of church members. Listen to me. Here's what a church that's carnal and divided needs. It needs revival. It needs the Holy Spirit of God to come down and the Holy Spirit of God to fill the members of that church so that they begin to go the right direction. A church that is carnal, a church that is divided needs revival. And I believe that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul gives us a glimpse of the revived life as far as ministry focus and intent is concerned. Paul spends the first five verses of this particular chapter rehearsing his ministry among the church at Corinth. And I think most of us would say if anyone was living a life that is revived, a revived life, it would be the Apostle Paul. And I believe that these first five verses provides a template for all local church gospel ministry. A template is simply a pattern or a mold. And and I believe the best patterns that we could possibly find regarding ministry life is a Bible pattern. In other words, to take it right out of Scripture. And look, I know there's lots of people that you could go to today that are trying lots of new things. And perhaps even some of these are are, are seeing some form of success. But I'm here to tell you that the, the greatest thing that you and I could do is figure out what does the Bible teach and follow it. Uh, Figure out what does the Bible want me to do? What does God want me to do? And and begin to walk that direction. Uh, And so we see here that this passage of Scripture gives us this template for gospel ministry. And I want to ask this question. Do you sometimes find your ministry stale? It's a good question. Do you sometimes find the ministry that you've been involved in? I look across this church tonight, and there's some of you have been teaching Sunday school for 50 years. And I am am astounded at your faithfulness, and we are blessed by your faithfulness. But even those that have taught Sunday school for 50 years sometimes perhaps would have to admit, you know, there are times in which I go through stale periods in life. Perhaps there are some of you that have worked a bus route for many years. Do you you find that uh, that ministry has become somewhat stale and and could use a, a, a fresh touch, a fresh anointing of the power and the Holy Spirit of God upon that particular ministry? Do you find yourself every once in a while just kind of going through the motions? You've done it so many times over and over again. You know just what to say and when to say it that you don't find yourself really relying upon the Holy Spirit of God too much. You instead are relying upon your own gifts and your own abilities and the things that you've learned over the years. Do you, do I, does our church, do we find ourselves in need of a revival in Christian living, gospel-centered focus in ministry? Let me ask you this question. Do we long, do we long to experience God's touch and power on our lives again? This is such a, I feel like this is such a rare thing in this day and age. Even Christians, God's people, we, we, we have become professional at being Christians, but we know very little of the power of God. And do you ever find yourself, I know I do, I know in my own personal life, there are times in which I, I, I feel so, so inadequate as a, as a follower of Jesus Christ. And I believe the Apostle Paul provides a powerful template for doing ministry in the local church that is pleasing to God. And I want us to notice four keys or four parts of this pattern, and we'll be done tonight. Number one, I want you to notice that this template for ministry features, first of all, this thought, and that is this. Number one, we must go to where lost people are. How do you you accomplish ministry? We must go to where lost people are. Look at verse number one. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you. Now, Paul's on the other side of it. 
And he's writing to the church at Corinth, and they're now brothers. But I want you to understand something. There was a time in which they were not brothers. The Apostle Paul was a saved individual, but living in the city of Corinth were hundreds of thousands of people who were unregenerate, who were lost, who did not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, perhaps didn't even, didn't even know his name, didn't know the life that he lived. And at a certain point in time, God burdened the Apostle Paul to go to the city of Corinth, and he did. He did. Paul went to this city that was that was large. It was a key city in in Greece. Paul marches right into that city. He doesn't perhaps know a soul. No one knows him. And he begins to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that if he'll do that, it'll be sufficient. What did Paul do? He went to where lost people are. Had Paul never gone, most likely the church of God at Corinth would never have existed Can I tell you something? The gospel does not go forward unless someone takes it there. And we've considered the the idea, the emphasis this year on following forward. And I want you to know something. The gospel of Jesus Christ, we we can't just pray and it'll magically happen. You and I must take the gospel to lost people. We can't just sit back and say, well, I've prayed for them. I'm I'm released from my duties. I don't have to do anything. I prayed for my neighbors this week. I don't have to go tell them. I don't have to live out my faith in front of them. I've prayed that someone would go to this foreign tribe in the Amazon of South, South America. So I'm good. I'm released from my duties. Listen to me. Somebody, somebody must take the gospel there. If the gospel is going, is going to go forward, people must take it to those places I want you to hold your place in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, and I want you to go back with me to the book of Romans. And I want you to notice what Paul writes here in Romans chapter number 10. Look what he says, beginning in verse number 13. Paul says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he asks some questions. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? You are aware that there are people all over our world that have never heard the name of Jesus. Did you you know that there are times in which, even on our own property, there are children that come on our church buses, and when they arrive, they only know the name of Jesus as it's used in profanity. They don't don't know who Jesus is. They they know that that his name in some circles, in some cases, is, is is a profane curse word when folks get angry or upset. But they don't they don't know the name of Jesus right here in our own community. Right here in the United States of America, there are people who don't know who Jesus is. And he says, how are they going to believe in him if they've never heard of him before? Notice, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now there is a common theme Throughout Scripture, we see it occasionally. In fact, in our own Sunday school lesson this morning, in the class that I was teaching, we considered this thought or this idea that in the Middle Eastern culture, feet are hideous things. Feet are very, very offensive. Uh, feet are, you know, to, uh, you know, they're just, you know, we're not, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to see them. We don't want to, we don't want anything to, to, to do with feet. And yet, and yet the Holy Spirit of God uses Paul to say that, listen, the feet of someone who takes the gospel to someone else are beautiful. That is the truth of Scripture. And I want you to know something, that the gospel, if it's going to go forward, we must take it forward. And Paul says, listen, in this template for ministry, if you're going to do ministry right, if you're going to do what God has called you to do, you must go to where lost people are. So who do you know that's lost tonight? If I were to ask you, I want you to pray for someone tonight who is lost, specifically by name. Could you in five seconds think of someone? I know many of you work outside of this place. And so perhaps you could, right away, you could think of someone who is lost. But you know there are times in which we so insulate ourselves as Christians and as believers That we know there are lost people out there, but they're sort of nameless and they're sort of faceless. And I'm thinking to myself that we have not followed the template for ministry. In some cases, we have not gone to where lost people are. We've not rubbed shoulders with them. We have not told them about the name of Jesus Christ who can forgive all sins. May God help us to go where lost people are like Paul did. 
I want you to know, secondly, not only must we go to where lost people are, but we must be who we are. Would you look at the end of verse number one? He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Look in verse number four. He says there, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. You know, Paul went to Corinth, and he did not adjust who he was in order to be more impressive or relevant. Greece, of course, was the, on the cutting edge of culture and of arts and of, and of, and of wisdom. And, and Paul, Paul did not go into Corinth and decide, you know, well, I've got, to make, I've got to make this message something that it's not. Paul went to Corinth, and he did the same thing he did in every other place that he had been. He preached Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he did not use enticing words of man's wisdom. That he, he, did not, uh, he did not do use excellency of speech. Uh, he did not try to become something that he was not so that he could reach uh, the, the city of Corinth and the people that were there. Uh, he, he simply declared unto them the testimony of God. You know, the testimony of God will do in every instance. In other words, the Bible will do in every instance. In every, in, every, in every possible way, you give people the Bible. It doesn't need any help. It just needs to be shared. God's word and his message is alive. It is powerful and it penetrates to the very soul. Brother Stover mentioned just a moment ago that as he stood and he quoted some scripture there in that house hearing there as it pertained to the heartbeat bill, he said his, to his left, and he shared this with me earlier, he said he could hear snickers and laughing as he quoted scripture. You know, what, you, know why they, you know why they laugh at the Bible? Because they've got to do everything they can to put it down because it is a living book. Because when they hear its words, it penetrates into the deepest part of their soul. The Bible is alive. And they must do everything they can to try to discredit it. Because if they, if they can't discredit it, then they must recognize, they must admit that the Bible is true and that they're lost and on their way to hell. And their whole agenda goes out the window. I want you to know something. The Bible is the Word of God. It is powerful. And you and I don't have to, don't have to do anything other than preach this book. It will do. We don't, have to, we, don't, we don't have to come up with some new idea, some new program. We just simply need to be faithful to proclaim the Word of God. This is what the Bible says about itself in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Do you, know the, do you know the Bible reads you like a book? Do you know the Word of God, it has, it has the answer to everything that you're facing, everything that you're thinking about? Do you know the Word of God, as we open it, it is so convicting we read it and we think to ourselves, you know, how, how was that written 2,000 years ago? And yet it is speaking to me directly. Because listen, it's a living book. And it may be an old book, but it is still alive today. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And I'm afraid that, as I said earlier, we've become professional at programs and, 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 and events. And, and there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with those things. But listen to me. Listen. The Bible will do. The Word of God will do if we'll just preach it, if we'll just share it. Notice thirdly, find the third thought is that we must focus on the most important thing. Would you look with me in verse number two? I love what he says here. He says, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, Paul didn't go to Corinth and didn't get involved in the political scene there. He didn't go to Corinth and he didn't figure out, okay, who are the movers and the, who are the shakers and let me see if I can, you know, whittle my way into this. And, and he, listen, he, he, was not, he was not at all interested in Corinthian culture. Paul says, I'm going there for one purpose. Paul, Paul as far as we know, Paul didn't buy a house in Corinth. Paul didn't look for a new career in Corinth. No, listen, Paul went to Corinth with one purpose in mind. And that was to know one thing among them and that was that they knew Jesus Christ and him crucified. His ministry, his life was driven and consumed by one thing only. I'm here to tell you that I am well aware that we must contend for the faith that's in the scriptures and we must answer critics and we must steward well the finances that God places in our hands. 
And we need to be involved with our community and guard against wolves who might try to infiltrate the church. And I think we even need to have some influence on political leaders. But I'm here to tell you that our focus ever needs to be on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We ask the question, why is this so important? Why does, why does it matter that we keep our eyes on Jesus, a crucified uh, Savior who is risen and coming again? Why is this important? And there's three reasons why the crucified Christ is the, be the most important thing. Can I say, first of all, the crucified Christ speaks of his love for us. Every time you mention the crucifixion, every time you show a, a picture that someone is depicted of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross, it screams in big, bold letters, love. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love, his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you, do you feel sometimes unloved? Have you ever been there? I, I, I have a very loving family, but I realize not everyone is that way. I, I have a very loving wife and, and loving children who, uh, who, who most of the time make me feel pretty good about myself, and I'm surrounded by a great church family that loves me. And you express your love to me. But you know, I know there are people that go through this life and they sometimes feel unloved. Perhaps they feel unimportant. Maybe nobody really knows their name. Can I tell you something? You take one glimpse at the cross of Jesus Christ and you'll feel all the love that you could possibly feel in this world. Because the crucified Christ speaks of his love for us. Amen. And why is the crucified Christ important? Because number two, the crucified Christ speaks of our need for a Savior. Again, I quote Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what do sinners need? They need a Savior. Sinners can't save themselves. Sinners cannot pull themselves out of the mess that they've created. They need someone else. And, and, and it can't just be anyone. It had to be a sinless Savior. Jesus Christ became that Savior for us and the crucified Christ. If we'll keep Him the main thing, we'll be reminded that there was a time when we needed a Savior and that there are people living around us who need a Savior as well. The crucified Christ it reminds us of his love. He reminds us of our need for a Savior. And thirdly, the crucified Christ speaks of his victory over death. Because I'm here to tell you, the crucified Christ didn't stay on that cross. That they took his body down. He was dead. There was no question about it. And they buried him in a borrowed tomb. But this coming Sunday, we'll celebrate a resurrected Savior. And the crucified Christ speaks of his victory over death and that we too can have victory over death just the same. I'm dealing with some folks right now who are dying and I'm seeing the incredible grace of God ministering in their lives. One who is quite young to be facing death, one who is quite up in years. Both of them have a testimony that they know Jesus. And both of them have looked me in the eye and they've said this, I'm not afraid to die. Amen. And they've said this, I'm looking forward to going and seeing Jesus. Amen. Listen, we, we, we can't have that without a crucified Christ. Amen. We can't have that without an empty tomb. The crucified Christ speaks of his victory over death. And Paul went into Corinth and he said, that's the most important thing. And I'm not going to get caught up in church politics. And I'm not going to get caught up in, in, in civil government. And I'm not going to get caught up in finances. And I'm not going to get bogged down with anything except for getting the gospel of Jesus Christ to this community. And so we must focus on the most important thing. And finally, if we're going to, if we're going to do ministry right, we must know the power of God. Would you look with me in verses 4 and 5? In my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, Paul did not rely on enticing or manipulative words of man's wisdom. Paul didn't go and tell cute stories that are emotional and tug on the heartstrings. Paul shared the truth. He shared the gospel. He preached Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But I want you to know something. Paul's preaching was spirit-filled. The power of God was upon the Apostle Paul. And it was upon his message. And it was upon his ministry. 
And Paul knew that if he won them with his own clever tactics or devices, their faith would not stand. I'm convicted by this. How many times, how many times have I been convinced that success could be had with better this or more of that? Well, if we just, if we just tweak this just a little bit, or if we just make this little change in, in, in what we do, or if we just give this away or, or, or do that, then we'll have some form of success. I, I, I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe if we, if we just had a little bit more money, if we had a little bit more money, we could hire somebody to take care of this particular ministry or this particular responsibility or role. If we, if we just had some folks who maybe were just a little bit more talented in this area, imagine what we could do over here thinking that it was a financial deficit or it was a talent deficit or thinking that it was a, it was a personnel deficit. And I want you to know something. When we're not successful in ministry, when we're not getting the job done, it's not a financial deficit. It's not a talent deficit. It's not a personnel deficit. It's not just tweak a little bit of here and a little bit there. Listen to me. It is a deficit of the power of God upon us. And I'm convicted by this. What we've needed all along was not out of reach. It wasn't just, well, if we had a little bit more of this. No, no, listen. It was within us all the time. What we've needed has been the power of God. It is the missing ingredient in most ministry work today, the power of God. This past week, I was on the phone with a man in our church, and he shared with me that his 92-year-old father had taken a fall. This man, who's 92 years old, has been a preacher for many, many years. He was born, I believe, in 1927, if I remember correctly. I think he preached his first sermon in the 1940s. He said, my dad took a fall and he's in, a, he's in an area rehab center. And, and I said, well, tell me where he's at and I'll go see him. And he goes, well, he's kind of, he's a ways away. He was in Cuyahoga Falls. And I said, man, I'd love to go see him. I, I know this man. We spent some time together. He's, he's been here on several occasions. Not a member of our church. But I went, I sat down with him, and he was so surprised that I was there. When I first walked in, I knocked on the door, and he heard my voice, but he didn't know who I was. He couldn't see, and, and so as I got a little bit closer, I, I got real close to him, and I said, hey, how are you? And he looked, he said, oh, he goes, I can't believe you came all the way out here to see me. Then I sat down, and we began to talk. It was just he and I there for a time. And this man had the unique privilege of being on the front lines of a revival that tore through the country of Canada several decades ago. It's a revival that is, that is well known in Christian circles in the country of Canada. And after spending some time with this man, I was asking him some questions and I asked him to pray for me. We both looked at each other and we both agreed that what is needed more than anything today from a man who has seen it with his own eyes, what is needed more than anything today is for the power of God to rest upon our lives. We don't, we don't need better programs. We've got, we've got programs coming out of our ears. We don't need more money. No, not, not, the, not saying that we've got money coming out of our ears, but I'm just saying we don't, that, that's not what we need. Listen, we, we, we don't even need more people. What we need is the power of God. And I'm thinking as we go into this week, in which we are anticipating hundreds of visitors here on Saturday and perhaps hundreds more on Sunday. What do we need? A better program? No, we need the power of God to fill His people so that when people walk onto this property, they'll say, there's, there's something different about this place. There's something unique. There's something here that I haven't felt anywhere else. We need the power of God. I said to this man, I said, would you, would you pray for me? And he said, I would be delighted. I placed my hand in his, and he prayed was just a simple prayer. I was, expecting, I was expecting for the heavens to open at some point, you know, knowing what this guy's been through, and 92 years old, and he's still got a sharp mind, and, and he's able to recall things just like that. And I, and I don't know what I was expecting, but you know, I was blown away. That prayer was the simplest prayer I've ever heard in my life. I, mean, I was expecting words that I didn't even know. I thought I'd have to get in my car and look, look them up on my phone. You know, what did that word mean, and what is this? There was none of that. Listen, he, he talked to God like you and I would talk to a, a dear, close friend. 
He knew him that well. I'm thinking to myself, listen, we, we don't have to have excellency, excellency of speech or wisdom. We don't, we don't need those things. We, we need God. We need to know God. I don't need, I don't need more degrees behind my name. I don't, I, I don't need more years in the ministry. I, listen, the power of God resting upon me will be sufficient. We, we don't need anything but that. And Paul says, here is the template for ministry. Go to where they are. Find some lost people. Tell them about Jesus. Every every last one of you on your way out of here tonight, you will pass a resource center filled with gospel literature. Take some with you and go where lost people are and find them. Don't don't leave here empty-handed. Take something with you. By the way, in the last month, month and a half or so, maybe even less than that, we've given out 20,000 pieces of literature about Easter Sunday. And I'm thankful for that, but listen to me, if we don't have the power of God, none of that matters. None of it matters. What do we need? We need to go to where lost people are. We need to be just who we are. We don't need to transform ourselves in anything but sinners saved by grace. we got to focus. We must focus on the most important thing. And I know there are times in which little offenses creep into our lives, and, and it's easy to get caught up in those things and to look down the pew at somebody who's offended you and to be upset with them. Paul said, put that stuff out of your mind. And and know one thing and one thing only, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And finally, we must focus. We must focus. We must know. We must have the power of God upon our lives.